My name is Dr. Charles Weaver. I am a medical oncologist and the founder and publisher of Cancer Connect. Thank you for joining us for an Ask the Expert web chat with Dr. Jacqueline Barrientos. Dr. Barrientos is a hematologist at North Shore Cancer Institute's CLL Research and Treatment Program. Her research focuses on identifying new and promising lymphoma and chronic leukemia therapies. In this informative web chat, Dr. Barrientos answers our questions about progress in blood cancer treatment and what's next for blood cancer research. The prevalence in the U.S. is about, uh, about more than a million people in America currently have a diagnosis of blood cancer or blood disorder or blood malignancy. About uh, every three minutes, we have one new person diagnosed in the United States alone. And uh, worldwide, it's uh, also very prevalent. So it's about 10% of all the cancers are a blood cancer. It's a changing um, field. The areas of blood cancer, we essentially have about 80 different subtypes of blood cancer. And just for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the most common type of lymphoma, we have about 60 subtypes. And as I understand, pathology doctors are getting together to maybe change, again, the, the definitions of every type of lymphoma. So it's an evolving field, but we have several subtypes. And it's based on the subtype of blood cancer that you have that then we can um, discuss what type of therapies we're going to use and how we're going to manage the condition. There are certain types of blood cancers, for example, that you essentially make the diagnosis, but you don't initiate therapy until the moment that you have symptoms. One of those, for example, is a chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is the most common adult leukemia in the US and in Western Europe. And essentially you don't have uh, therapy started up until the moment that you have symptoms like anemia that's causing symptoms or low uh, platelets that are causing symptoms and you have bleeding issues or lymph nodes that are very large. So for those types of lymphomas like CLL or for example an indolent lymphoma like follicular lymphoma, you don't start therapy immediately unless you have symptoms. There are other types of lymphomas that are aggressive or other types of blood cancers that are aggressive. And you have to initiate therapy immediately, otherwise the disease will take over and have too many complications. So it all depends on what type of diagnosis you have at the moment that you, know, you get a diagnosis of a blood cancer. Success depends a lot on each individual person. For some people, success will mean for them going into remission for some other people, it will mean the ability to go back to live their life the way that it was before the diagnosis. And for some other people, it, it, it depends a lot on, on the type of, of disease that they have. For example, if they have an aggressive lymphoma that is potentially curable, the goal will be um, to cure it. And to be successful, you would have to get the disease in, into a condition where you think that the disease is no longer um, visible. Um, if you were to relapse with that type of disease, the goal or the success would be defined as being able to get that disease again into remission. For some other people with certain types of uh, chronic uh, blood malignancies or blood cancers, uh, the goal is different. The goal is mainly to get you to be and have the, the best that you can be with a good quality of life um, with the least amount of therapy so that you don't develop toxicities from the therapy. Over the last couple of years, a lot of things have changed. Um, our understanding of these uh, blood malignancies has evolved significantly. And it didn't happen overnight. It essentially took several years for researchers to find out certain uh, mutations that make you more uh, prone to um, have the disease get more and more aggressive. And in, in essence, some doctors found certain mutations that were a good target and then made you know, the, the difference in the patient's life. And I think we all know the success story of, for example, um, chronic myelogenous leukemia, also known as CML, where several years ago, more than a decade ago, um, a doctor found that if you just target that mutation that is there, you could control it with just a pill instead of like using chemotherapy. So the goal, ever since that has been to try to maybe, you know, 
with this new understanding of the underlying mechanisms of how the cancer evolves, maybe use new targeted approaches that can um, get the disease in control or in remission and maybe combine it with chemotherapy to get even better success rates. So right now the field is evolving and there's a lot of new approaches that are, we're just learning to use um, in terms of new targeted therapies. And there's a lot of new drugs that are only in clinical trials right now, but that are very promising. So it, it's an evolving field. And I encourage all the people that have a, a diagnosis of a blood cancer or maybe a family member with a blood cancer to um, go to educational sessions where they can learn about the advances because um, it's always good to be uh, you know, an empowered patient with all the education that is out there. Um, there's many societies that have educational events for patients like the American Cancer Society, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, Lymphoma Research Foundations. They all have events um, where the physicians that are doing this work um, get together with the patients and explain in an easy way to understand what are the new advances for each individual type of cancer. Like I said, um, a blood cancer or a blood malignancy, it, it depends a lot on the diagnosis that you have in order for us to tell you how things will be managed or what clinical trials are available. Um, it's very important to know that over time, the more that we learn about these conditions, we have uh, developed new ways to figure out if these drugs are efficacious. And why is this? Because uh, traditionally, we essentially said, well, this drug works because people are living longer. However, sometimes if you were to wait for that endpoint of living longer, you would have to wait several, several years. That's the reason why investigators get together and figure out other endpoints that may take a shorter amount of time and that would help you um, determine whether a drug is effective, comparing it to the standard of care or to other therapies that are available. One of them, for example, is uh, the assessment of complete remission. Complete remission or CR, it's a good endpoint because it usually in several diseases correlates with uh, the time in remission. And complete remission essentially uh, tells you that there's no um, visible or palpable uh, blood malignancy and, and you are essentially in, in a remission. It, the cancer is it's not found. Um, another endpoint that we use in certain types of blood cancers is called MRD or minimal residual disease. And in essence, MRD negativity in certain patients treated with certain approaches uh, correlates with a deeper um, response and the depth of the response correlates with a longer time in remission and a longer um, time to progress and a longer overall survival. So that's another one of the endpoints that we're still studying. But as I said, this is still an evolution. We're still studying these in different types of patients and different cancers because every cancer has a different endpoint. It is a very personal decision. I think um, it, it takes time commitment. It depends also on your type of cancer and also depends on what you can hear or read and understand from the drug that is being tested or the intervention that is being tested. Um, I encourage the patients to talk to their own doctors and ask them if they know of any clinical trial that would be promising in their own condition. There are, at any given time, a lot of clinical trials and usually what we do and are asked by the National Institutes of Health is to put every clinical trial on the website. So if you go to um, www.clinicaltrials.org, you can actually search for the type of cancer and you can see an array of or a list of uh, clinical trials that are currently open and the sites where they are open. So not only, you know, you can ask your doctor, you can also look on the website to see what clinical trials are open for your type of cancer. Every person is different. There are certain eligibility criteria that you have to meet in order to participate in a clinical trial. So there's no one size fits all. And you have to see and understand what the risks and benefits of each participation in each clinical trial entails. You 
have to ask your doctor uh, what are the risks and benefits of participating in the clinical trial? What success has been heard of from participation in the clinical trial? What phase the clinical trial is? Um, phase one is essentially trying to assess safety of the intervention. A phase two, it's a little bit larger cohort of patients um, trying to assess more uh, response rate. And then a phase three trial, it's essentially a larger trial where you compare with something that is standard of care. So it depends on the phase, um, depends on the length of the, of the trial. Some trials um, are only for one year or for a given time. Some other trials are open-ended. As long as you are having response to the therapy, you can continue um, on, on the trial. It's very important to discuss that with your doctor. Also important to discuss in terms of insurance, if your insurance would pay for um, the clinical trial participation, and also what the clinical trial will pay if your insurance denies coverage for a certain procedure. Those are things that are essentially the most important in my mind, but it's also important as a patient to figure out if the participation will uh, interfere with your own uh, job. There are certain people that say, absolutely, I cannot make it an appointment every week or every other week in order to participate in this trial because unfortunately my job doesn't allow me to take some time off. So it, it depends a lot also on whether you have transportation issues. So it's a very personal choice and you have to put all those things into account based on the risks and perceived benefits that you can get from participation in the clinical trial. So I'm very, very optimistic, very reassured uh, that the uh, research that we are doing right now is bringing us to a place that we haven't been, you know, it's a new millennium in my mind. Uh, things are changing quite rapidly. You really have to try to think, seek um, a second opinion if you ever feel that your doctor is not providing you the right answers because there's a lot of new agents um, in our armamentarium recently approved by the FDA or um, in clinical trials that may not be accessible to you unless you participate in a clinical trial. And it's always good to be an informed consumer. We think that in the future, what we will achieve will be able to get longer remissions um, with less toxicity because the drugs are getting better at just targeting the cancer instead of targeting all the other good cells that may cause you to um, have complications from the therapy. So that's very good. And a lot of people feel that with the newer agents in certain types of diseases, they can live full lives uh, that resemble um, a time when they didn't have the, the disease diagnosis. So it's very important uh, for you as a, as a patient, I think, to be educated. Don't be afraid to reach out to, you know, seek a second opinion. Um, ask your doctor if they know any potential drugs that are less uh, toxic. Um, and I think that in the future we'll have a lot of new combination strategies that were not available before. And we're currently doing clinical trials for that. So we are very, very optimistic that in the future our patients will really feel like, you know, these are chronic conditions and um, Hopefully, many more people will be able to achieve a cure. Most recently, about a month ago, uh, the group, the, for example, the Hairy Cell Leukemia Consortium showed their data on the New England Journal um, of Medicine, which is one of the most elite uh, medical journals. And it showed responses uh, that were unbelievable for people with relapsed refractory hairy cell leukemia with a drug that is approved for melanoma. So. It's essentially um, a different change. You know, the drug was approved based on a mutation and anyone with a disease called hairy cell leukemia carries that mutation. So the response rates were anywhere from 96% to 100%. And even after they stopped the therapy, people were still in remission for a long period of time. So this was all based on knowing um, the pathology of the disease that everyone with this uh, mutation can respond to the therapy. So it's, it's, it's so amazing. The future is, is changing in front of our eyes. And this just happened, you know, it was published, I believe, less than a month ago. In CLL, there's been three new drugs approved in the last two years, three years by the FDA. Um, they are all targeted um, with much less toxicity than what we've seen traditionally with chemotherapy. And right now, the world of multiple myeloma is seeing the change that 
Um, there's a lot of promising um, new drugs that are monoclonal antibodies. And up until now, we never use monoclonal antibodies for the therapy of multiple myeloma. Those drugs are not yet approved, but they are very promising. And it seems that uh, they might be um, part of the new armamentarium in the future. N another point that I think it's very important to mention is um, the changes that are happening right now with people with acute uh, lymphocytic leukemia, ALL. The group from University of Pennsylvania showed a new in, uh, intervention where they take the T cells of the patients, re-engineer them with a virus to recognize the actual malignant cells, and then they put them back into the patient's blood and the cells kill the leukemia. So you have your own cells that are essentially doing the killing for you. They recognize the, the, the leukemia and then you go into remission. It has been uh, very, very, uh, promising results in the patients with ALL that have been treated with this intervention. Uh, right now it's only in clinical trials, but it's so promising and it has never been seen before. So we think that at some point this will be another intervention for, for people with relapsed um, ALL. So the future is changing very quickly and I encourage all of you um, that are um, viewing this educational session to, to really um, educate yourself because it's it's important. Things are changing very rapidly.